this and knowledge towards uh, an ecological transition. More people have a To the nitty gritty, everybody see this shared screen? Have more trickling in. All right. So, yeah, I'll go to the to this plan as people are arriving. Um, so, like I said, the title. Title of this workshop is Invasive Materials, Rebuilding Relationships with Distance. Um, and today we'll begin with a bit of and background uh, in which we'll discuss uh, the Dessouche project that I directed here at the, uh, throughout this spring. And then we'll quickly look at the case of uh, the invasive soil. Um, after that, we'll look at um, how invasive species landscapes and think of the potential of restoring better relationships to them. After this, we'll get into the main part of the workshop, which is the demonstration. Uh, that'll take up the larger chunk of today's workshop. And then we'll end with uh, questions uh, and an open discussion where I look forward to hearing from uh, your insights, ideas, and feedback. So, so Dessouche uh, was an experimental design project. Uh, that use the creation of a biomaterial uh, made from Eurasian milfoil, which is uh, this plant here that you see at the bottom left. Um, using this transformation as an opportunity to discuss the potential of biomaterials and materiality in building stronger, uh, more engaged relationships with local landscapes and especially disturbed ones. Um, so from January to April, myself and Concordia graduate Larissa Zemke, uh, we experimented with this plant in trying to give it different forms uh, using a variety of different methods before settling on the one that I'll present today. Easily transmittable uh, and replicated and by others. We worked only with materials and tools that were readily available Uh, uh, two other workshops. Um, the first of the Lake Lover. Uh, just east of. Um, and one. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if everybody is here and fine. I, I can't hear you. Oh, is, is the audio not great? Yeah, the audio keeps choppy, keeps being choppy. It keeps cutting out, in and out. Okay, I'll try. Does it work better when I'm closer to this side? Um, More or less. It's hard to tell what exactly is causing that audio uh, mm -hmm. choppiness, but it seems that, I mean, we're getting a lot of information, but it's we're missing a lot too, so I don't know. Is this any better? Slightly. I can hear that. Okay, perfect. I'll I'll just talk loudly. Um, yeah. If any if anyone else has any problems hearing uh, what I'm saying, just like raise your hand. I'll just <laughs> start moving towards towards the computer where it's picking uh, the sound up from. So. So yeah, so I was saying um, we hosted two, two workshops uh, in the spring. The first one was with uh, members of this small community who live by a lake that has been seeing um, the increase and in propagation of milfoil uh, in their lake for over a decade now. And the second one was with uh, students, artists, and different practitioners, both at Concordia um, and from elsewhere. 
And so through our discussions, we were able to uh, get a sense of how invasive species disturb uh, and affect different communities, how these communities work uh, to, uh, to address the issues and how, how they live with it on a daily basis, uh, but also to see how artists and designers across Canada, both at Concordia and elsewhere, are also actively working with uh, invasive species and, and different plants in, in their work. Uh, so through our material research, we're able to put together uh, the method that I will be presenting today. So moving on. Um, yeah, like this was a, so it had two purposes. Uh, the main one was to make uh, this biomaterial, was to come up with a recipe uh, to, to create this material at home with simple kitchen appliances. And the second one was to engage local communities in making bioobjects and using that opportunity to reflect on sustainable approaches to invasive species management. So at the bottom, there's a few screenshots from uh, different videos and Zoom meetings, uh, webinars that we hosted. Uh, that, as you'll, you see in the bottom right, was very similar uh, to today's. So moving right along. Moving right along. Um, the plant that we've been working with, like I said, it's called Eurasian milfoil. And um, this will give you a bit of a sense of almost like a case study of how working with uh, biomaterials or with invasive species integrates larger issues. Um, and I also wanted to specify that, you know, although we've been working with this specific plant, the purpose of today's workshop is sort of to open up discussions um, about, you know, invasive species at large, uh, and that the method that we're showing today isn't specific to Eurasian milfoil. It can pretty be pretty much be adopted uh, and used with any sort of plant matter. So uh, Eurasian milfoil is nicknamed the zombie plant and has been uh, in Quebec since the 1970s when it was first spotted on the banks of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, today it's estimated to be in over 200 lakes across the province, although many of them uh, are suspected to be unregistered, uh, so there's an assumption that there's actually more than these 200 lakes. Uh, and its presence and propagation are both, uh, are both anthropic. They're caused by human movement, um, and, and activity. So it was introduced to North America, presumably as a decorative aquarium plant. Uh, you can still purchase it online for your aquarium if you are if you, you don't know its, its potential um, and its consequences. Or it was introduced through ship ballast from Eurasia. Um, when ships come across the, the oceans, they fill um, themselves up with, with water to, to remain buoyant. And so presumably was introduced through that water and then dumped uh, somewhere, somewhere in the St. Lawrence. Eurasian milfoil spreads really easily and quickly uh, because it has three propagation methods. So through seed reproduction, stem fragmentation, and rhizome network, uh, it can spread and colonize bodies of water extremely quickly and can essentially uh, choke out small bodies of water. Um, what I mean by choking out is it pushes out um, native species, both plant species uh, and larger, larger fish, um, and is often the result of uh, heavy boating activity. So because it spreads through stem fragmentation, uh, any disturbance can lead, can carry a stem across uh, elsewhere in that same body of water or even to another body of water. A lot of boats propellers get caught up in it um, and people don't clean it and so it's transported from lake to lake without people really being aware. And so, like I said, it can completely colonize uh, and uh, eutrophy small bodies of water. So, so it, it um, is a huge increase of nutrients in the water, which then can have effects such as um, algal blooms um, and uh, increasing the heat, the temperature of the water, uh, and at the same time, lowering biodiversity. Um, and also what's interesting is that it also translates into social and economic consequences. So it impedes on water recreation, uh, which then in turn lowers land value, which then affects the revenue of small municipalities. And so my own relationship to milfoil uh, dates way back. I uh, used to spend my summers as a kid by Lake Lovering and um, 
I would frequently swim in it. Uh, and so recently working actively with it and manipulating it uh, in ways that, that in which I create a relationship to it that has really changed my own perception of myself in that environment, both um, as a designer, but also just as a person who, who inhabits uh, those, those landscapes. Um, so we want to move on. Um, sorry. Exotic invasive species um, is a growing phenomenon around the world. Uh, and, uh, and is another manifestation of what we now commonly call the Anthropocene. Uh, so a bit like, you know, climate change or any sort of very contemporary ecological realities, uh, exotic invasive species are not going anywhere uh, as long as we keep moving around the globe. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And so um, as there's more and more human movement, more and more species are accidentally or intentionally brought into new environments and ecosystems uh, that don't have the characteristics, characteristics uh, or, or regulating factors, if you will, that, that limit its spread. Um, and so this is an important notion to, to understand, is that in invasive species uh, are always native to one place, to, to one local ecosystem. And so when they're brought to another one, uh, the regulating el elements that would normally reduce its spread, such as a predatory species or um, or even climate a local climate for instance um, those those factors aren't in the new environment which then just leads to its propagation um, and so here we have two sort of quotes one from the government of Quebec that defines invasive species um, and that so that's a, a plant animal or microorganism that's introduced outside of its natural area of distribution and then we have Robert Creed, who also tells us quite uh, bluntly that a major factor influencing the species composition of almost every community uh, is the intentional, intentional or accidental introduction of exotic plants and animals. So, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, another important notion to understand is that not all exotic species are invasive. Some of them are brought uh, to new environments uh, from elsewhere and integrate those ecosystems quite well. Uh, they can also be beneficial or can just integrate seamlessly. And so what's particularly interesting with milfoil is that the research is, is a little bit torn. It's, it's not black or white. Um, some, some studies demonstrate its harmful effects on uh, native flora and fauna, while others uh, suggest that it can have positive uh, impacts in small to medium colonies. So large colonies, predominantly have negative effects, while smaller um, to medium colonies can be beneficial, um, acting, integrating food chains, for instance, or in some cases acting as a wave block. So they form these very dense thick mats. Um, they can grow up to a thousand plants per square meter. And so it's presumed that uh, that can protect the lake floor from heavy uh, waves. And so common approaches to invasive species management uh, generally revolves around eradication and protection. And these two, these two approaches, uh, while necessary, are uh, time consuming and costly. Um, for instance, uh, since 1970, it's cost Canada around $22.8 billion uh, to manage and fight the certain invasive species. Um, and at the same time, grassroots efforts, grassroots efforts um, regularly face uphill battles um, vouching for legislation by governments and at all levels. So most importantly, um, these, these approaches illustrate a particular way of framing the natural world um, as something that's either pristine or spoiled. So there's like a before and after state um, and that sees it as a sort of a static, a static um, ensemble rather than an ever changing thing or something that's con continuously adapting and as we know, ecosystems are always undergoing changes and adapting, especially um, with increasing human activity. And so this workshop and my research sort of asks the question um, whether eradication and prevention are the only things that we should aim towards. And more to the point asks, what if uh, us humans through our own practices became the missing regulating factor uh, that, that invasive species essentially need 
to be contained uh, and to still offer uh, certain, certain beneficial factors to native species and even to us. So, so how do these materials, how do these plants um, translate into materials and offer us the possibility to work, to work with them rather than against them? And how do we integrate these, um, this work into common practices? So this is sort of the framework that I'm working in. Um, and I tried to illustrate sort of the, the, the sequence of thoughts that have led uh, us to, to this workshop today. So I hope, I hope this was a good enough introduction and that it made sense um, to everyone. And so without further ado, if there are any other questions, we'll just jump right into it. Um, is the sound better now or is it still excellent? Perfect. All right. So I'll stop the uh, screen share. All right. So before uh, going any further, I just wanted to show you some samples of um, different things that were made throughout this research, just to give you an idea of what we're working towards today. Um, so we came up with a variety of forms, um, certain cup shapes, um, and we're following roughly sort of like a paper making approach. Um, a little bit closer here. And so we're only working with uh, natural non-toxic materials and ingredients. Um, so we can make we have cups, we have these, these rounded tiles, um, and we're not looking to, we're not thinking too much of a purpose at this point. We're more thinking about the shapes and forms that we can give it. Um, and then obviously these sheets of paper um, that have different textures, different tones. Some are a little bit more felty, some are a little uh, a bit more uh, or thinner and more you know, essentially papery. And right, so if you guys are interested, you can, I think in the group chat, um, if you guys can see at the very top, I put a link here, I'll put it again, um, to our Facebook page. And if you guys go on the Facebook page, the very first post is uh, a step-by-step -step process for making um, the material that we're making today. If you guys wanna follow along at the same time, it can get a bit confusing if I'm just speaking and you don't really know where I'm going. Uh, so you guys are welcome to check that out. Let me know, maybe give me a thumbs up if you found it, if it's clear. Annie? Yeah. Yes, I would like to know how do you harvest them? Like, what do you, do you just have them? Do you go to the roots or you just take the, the top one and then you make them dry? Yeah, this is, this is a, a really important point to address um, and that I should have addressed earlier on today, especially for species like milfoil that spreads so easily. Um, I'm not trying to encourage in this workshop that we all go out afterwards and go to a lake that has no foil and collect it because obviously this is like an uncontained form of, of harvesting and at a large, you know, if, if everybody goes out and collects their milfoil that way, we risk seeing like more propagation. We were lucky enough to get it through um, a nonprofit organization that does, um, that works in eradicating milfoil. And so they were generous enough to, to provide some um, that they were, that they were cutting essentially anyways. Um, and so, yeah, there are different, in, in certain lakes, for instance, uh, milfoil washes up on the shore um, or, you know, people wash it off their boats and it's just left to dry on the ground, which could be different ways of harvesting it. But like I said today, it's, it's more to think, you know, this method could be applied to any type of um, plant matter, um, any sort of like cellulose matter, which is what this is. So, so yeah, so I would encourage you to not go out and harvest milk oil um, by yourself unless you were able to, to get in touch with the local organization, which, in which case that would be great. Yeah, cool, thank you, thanks for that. Uh, so if everyone has the, um, the uh, recipe in front of them, uh, I already, you'll see the first step is to boil the plant matter. And so I've already done it here. I have about two cups um in this blender already kind of 
do a close up and show you guys. Oh, this is the challenge of being alone in a room is you always have to go and search the cameras yourself. Um, so, so here we have one cup of uh, boiled milk oil that was boiled for over two hours. This ensures it's, it breaks down um, the fibers in it, but also, you know, assures that it's fully dead. And at the same time, we have a quarter cup of cardboard um, that will, that just adds to the material uh, more, more cellulose uh, and a little bit more structural integrity. So what we're going to do is blend it to a pulp. Um, to do that, we're going to add about a cup, a cup and a half of water, uh, just enough so that it blends smoothly. And yeah, it shouldn't be too loud, uh, but yeah, maybe watch out. And essentially you want to blend it until there is, uh, there are no large bits or pieces until the cardboard is fully turned up. So here we go. And if you do this yourself at home, um, you essentially can just add water um, until, you know, if, if you didn't, haven't put enough water, um, it'll likely get jammed and then you just add some more. I think we're mostly good. So you get sort of this nice goopy milk oil goop substance. It's not very appetizing. And over here, we'll grab a bin. Here, switch cameras. We'll grab a bin and, and our strainer. And essentially, you'll just strain out the water so that you have only your goop. And you want to make, you want to try to essentially get all the water out. Uh, well, not all of it, but as much as you can out of your pulp. You're essentially just shaking it around. And we're going to let this sit for a while. I'm going to set it over here. And let this sit here. And we're going to move on to another step, which is essentially making a almost like a, a bioplastic out of potato starch. And this will mix with um, with the pulp afterwards so that um, so that it'll just bind the material better together. Some of the papers, for instance, here, I think this one, yeah, has has very little. And you see how it's, it's much more um, almost felty while the others are a little bit more rigid and have a bit more structural integrity. So depending on what you want to work with, um, this potato starch additive will just give it a little bit more structure and solidity. So have you seen the recipe? Yeah, Annie? That's uh, some great comments in the, in the conversation and I think you, you don't read it, so I can read it, but you have the, uh, DigiLab told that maybe you can use a cheesecloth like how many yeah. water can it can it exactly so oh sorry yeah that was gonna be that was gonna be the next step uh, so we have a cheese cloth here and we're we're gonna put it in afterwards we're just gonna go to the potato starch uh, first uh, okay sorry. we're just gonna let it uh, drip a tiny bit before that and does it smell uh, no so as as it says in the recipe if um, milfoil smells a lot when you boil it, um, and so by adding a bit of salt and uh, white vinegar, that smell, like now, now it doesn't smell of anything uh, after boiling for two hours in it, uh, which was a huge improvement after the first iteration, because then we had different cups and different things that just smelled terrible. Uh, so, so now we have a, a pretty, a quite odorless 
uh, product and it's a real point. So thanks for the question. <laughs> Could you give us a feel for how the material you're bending there? Is it brittle? Is it paper like? Yeah, I'll go. Like, do you mean do you mean the the things we've made or the plants? Yeah, yeah. Just I, I, obviously we're looking on video. We can't tell. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to communicate. So so all of these different samples of paper have different rigidities. Uh, yeah. For instance, this one is this wow. one is quite uh, malleable. Um, focus. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I can I can bend it and it doesn't crack. It's sort of it, it's contained pretty well. Can we sew it, maybe? Right. Sew it. Do it. Sew. I can't hear you. So. Yeah. Sewing. Is it, yeah. Is it a oh, fabric? For sewing. Yeah. No. I. I don't think it would work for sewing. It's like it's not quite. Um, it's not like it's a, not. a textile. No. I think it would. It would come undone. But I, like I also haven't tried it, so I can't compare. What if it was coated with a bioplastic surface? Then I think it could probably be sewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we experimented with with coating with bioplastics, um, and the results were were quite mixed. But again, this is like what I'm offering today is really a starting point, and hopefully you guys can can all take it and make it your own and, and keep playing with it. Um, for instance, this one, this little tile here, was uh, not sure. If it's um, yeah, this one was actually soaked. Uh, in in the bioplastic that we're about to make, and it's it's quite solid. So so both of them together can attain quite a a, a good rigidity. Um, and then an application for that could be could be pretty much anything that you decide. To make. Um, so these are two. I'm like I'm quite I'm pressing quite hard right now. And the only reason it's, it's bent is because when it dried, it, it warped like that. Um, but without, maybe with a better sort of drying system um, that you don't necessarily have at home, you could find ways to, to air it out and have it dry in a flat way. Yeah. Uh, how long has that sample that was really rigid been alive? So how how what's what's at the least, life on that? At least since March. Yeah. March and April, so quite some time. Yeah. Um, are we good to move on? Excellent. Okay. So, so to make our our bioplastic slash potato starch additive, um, we're gonna start. I'm just gonna turn this hot plate to max, and we're gonna start with two cups of water. I'll switch over to the other camera so you guys can see better. Um, and right here we have some, um, or uh, I don't know if it's organic, but unmodified potato starch um, that you can pretty much find in any grocery store. And we are going to add um, one tablespoon and a half. And a lot of people online and I think different research center, research centers um, are are playing around with with potato starch bioplastics. Um, some use corn starch, and they're quite easily accessible and easy to find online. And everyone sort of has their own take of what what method is the best. So, and this one is a compromise and all those and just uh, a method that works best for our needs. So we have one tablespoon uh, and a half of potato starch, and then we're going to grab our glycerin, which is um, an emulsifier that you could find in any um, pharmacy or pretty much pretty much anywhere that is used. Um, it's it's used, it's a natural ingredient. It's just it's com comes from plants, um, and and what glycerin will do is at a molecular level, um, it has these very it has this composition that is. Um, if I remember correctly, inserts itself between the very rigid composition of potato starch and adds it some um, malleability. So if it were only potato starch, 
uh, whatever you were making would be brittle and would crack. And um, the glycerin essentially adds adds flexibility to it. So I'll come up to close up here where you'll see it'll kind of stick together um, at the bottom. And so you just want to make sure it's homogenous before oops, some crap over there. Might be a few bits of fabric going around here. Um, right, so we have sort of this milky substance. And I'll come up for a close up uh, in a few seconds as well. But essentially, you want to make sure that you're you're continuously um, just continuously giving it some movement and um, not letting it congeal in certain spots, which uh, it's it's prone to do. And as you wait and as it heats up gradually, it'll start forming um, a denser, thicker sort of um, almost like a, a thick syrup. And if you kept it, if it kept going, it would become um, more, more like a gel. Uh, but we don't want, for the purposes of today's workshop, we don't want to go to the gel part. Um, we're going to stop around when it's when it's quite syrupy, and you'll see you'll see why. So at this point, it's already starting to uh, stick to the bottom, and yeah, we just want to keep mixing it. We boil it. Like, what's the texture in there? Like, is it doing bubbles or? Yeah, I can show you. No, it's not. You don't want it to boil. Um, there we go. Don't want it to boil. It's still sort of this milky substance. But if you see at the bottom here, it's starting to to clump up a little bit, or just to become thicker. It's like a glue. And this is this is perfect. Essentially, this is what. This is what we want. It, it really doesn't take long before it starts doing this. I just show on the camera without pouring it out. Um, but this is pretty much the consistency that we want. We may put it on for a little bit. Um, see, it sticks to the to the spoon a bit. Yeah, I like I like to give myself the benchmark of like a thick a thick syrup, um, like thicker than than you'd want. <laughs> On your pancakes. So we're going to set that aside and I'm going to go over to, to the cheesecloth over here. So we have uh, our cheesecloth, which could really be this is just an old piece of cotton, very thin piece of cotton that I recycled from somewhere. So you really don't need to go out of your way to buy a brand new cheesecloth. And we're going to take our, our clump. Let's see, very close up is better. We're going to take our pulp and plop it right in the middle and fold corners of the cheese cloth over on top and just squeeze out there. Squeeze out the excess water see where you guys can see me better. Just squeeze out the excess water. You can get quite a lot out. And this, this part also requires certain um, attention. We don't want to squeeze too much water out so that um, it becomes, which is what I may have done right now, but I think it'll be okay. I'll bring it up close. You guys can see properly. It's starting to break apart. This is the challenging part of doing a virtual workshop with all the material side that you guys would normally see and feel it's trying to communicate it through a camera. Um, but essentially it's it's breaking apart uh, in these in these um, yeah, in this kind of very you can see the fibers. Um, essentially what you want, the inside is probably better. But what you want is to be like a clay. Um, this is why in the recipe it's called plant, we call it plant clay, because um, you essentially want to give it a shape or, or a, a consistency that you'd be able to mold just like clay. 
Um, and so, and so the water sort of acts as, you know, almost, almost like keeps it together better. Um, but this, this will be fine. This consistency will be fine for the purposes of today's workshop. So we'll just bring this over into a small mixing bowl right here. We'll just plop it in there. Move these things out of the way. And we're going to add our potato starch right onto it and into it. And we want to make sure we get all of it. And we're essentially going to mix them together until they're perfectly homogenous. Does it have like a big retraction when it dries? Um, I would say a re an important enough retraction that um, I would say, like, for instance, the shape that we're going to do today, which is which is mimicking this shape. Here, this is maybe a good way to see it. Um, this shape was acquired on the same mold that we're going to use today, which is this bowl. And so the difference in size is of maybe an inch or maybe two. Uh, maybe more an inch, yeah. Um, or an inch or three quarters of an inch on all sides, I would say. So and this is a good you, way of, of seeing did it. Did you try without the excess of water in the plant? Like if you really, really squeeze, does it have the same retraction? Um, without adding water, you said? No, but you squeeze with the cheese plot and then yeah. you say, don't squeeze too much because it, it, you need like a clay face. Yeah. But what if you squeeze it and it's really, really dry and you do your mixing with that hope that it's really, really dry? Does it have this uh, the only problem, the more it's the drier it is, the harder it is to give it a shape um, because, it, because it'll break apart. Well, you'll, we'll see when we'll mold it on the bowl. Um, but the, if it is too dry, then your pieces will, will fall off and won't, won't hold together into um, sort of a, a cohesive shape. Need some but the great thing, I don't know, what, what I learned through experimenting with this is like, is over time you really start to get a feel for, for what, what works and what holds together and, and what doesn't. And so the more you work with it, sort of, the more you get to experiment with, um, with trying different things. Like I'm sure, um, I'm sure there are other additives or just other things that that we could play with that um, that would give it a different type of, of texture or or um, or feel. Yeah. And so, is it so like is... clay? At the end of it, your bowl. If it if you fill it of water, does it like melt down? Uh, if you maybe if you left the water in there for multiple hours, um, but you know it could contain also serve to contain non liquids. Um, but liquids would stay for, you know, a short period of time. It would be, it's, it's the same, it's the same as having a paper cup, say. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here we are, it's perfectly mixed. And, and this is, this is the next, this is like the next level of, of clayiness, if you will. Um, so it really holds together quite well. Um, it has sort of a, a sheen to it. Like some like a, a listening, uh, which which is the potato starch, and so this is this is perfect. Um, and now we're going to go over to our bowl and and uh, and mold it. I'm just going to move some things out of the way just to have some space and for you guys to see better. Are there any more questions at this point? Yes, Digital Media Lab. I'm Caitlin. Um, okay, so I'm wondering, have you have you tried substituting for the potato starch something like tapioca starch? Mm -hmm. uh, I I haven't. Um, I I stuck with um, here. I'll change the camera so you can see. I stuck with potato starch just because I was thinking of um, materials or, or ingredients that didn't have to travel too far before using them. Uh, and so the, the potato starch is made in Canada, which was good enough for me, but I'm sure the tapioca, corn starch, 
Um, there's so many other different types of starches that I'm sure act all slightly differently, but generally, generally bring the same sort of addition to, to whatever you're trying to make. And then I have one more question. Yeah, of course. Um, so and this might be jumping ahead too far, but I'm curious, uh, how does the material attach to other surfaces? So have you, um, like for instance, I was thinking about the application of it being on a wood surface or functioning like a, like a coating or even a veneer type of something? Interesting. Um, I haven't, I haven't played around with other surfaces really. Um, I've like, Maybe that's next. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I've experimented with, um, the plant clay and, um, just using the, you know, the, the potato starch or the bioplastic as its own, as its own sort of medium. Uh, but this definitely sounds like a very interesting avenue to, to pursue. Thanks. I'm All in right. Montreal. We will oh. try. <laughs> Sorry? I'm in Montreal, we will try. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Thomas, can, can, okay. can you bleach the, the clay? Can you put that uh, chlorine or something to bleach it to, to make a kind of a wider paper? Mm -hmm. I was looking, uh, obviously, yeah, that, that reflection came up when, especially when we were producing um, these sheets of paper. Um, it came up and then we were thinking, well, we really wanted to go as far as we could with uh, keeping it non-toxic or using non-toxic materials. So we tried bleaching it with um, uh, peroxide and lemon juice, and it, it didn't change much. I believe this is the one. It brought, it made a slightly, change cameras. It made a, a slight difference in tone, but not enough to, to whiten it. But but bleach, I, I would be surprised if, if actual bleach didn't didn't change anything. I think I think you'd get much better results with actual bleach. But pursuing and trying to use non-toxic materials, we we settled with that and, and left it there. So are we good to keep going? This is this is the final step. Um, so I'll bring this. So, that's out of the way. All right. So, what you want to take, whichever mold thing you want to mold, make the, your shape out of. Um, you want to make sure that it's, uh, you know, that it, it will. If you anticipate it shrinking or, or removing it, uh, you don't want anything uh, concave. And so, um, and so, any shape like a bowl or a cup, for instance that doesn't have any outline ridges or anything is perfect. Um, some, some surfaces, especially ceramics, I found have different ways. Sometimes the, um, the plant clay will stick to it very intensely and it'll be really difficult to take it off. So what we do in that case is um, if you can get your hands on some, this is, this is uh, wood coating beeswax, uh, but shea butter would work as well. And essentially you just want to find anything that would act as uh, a lubricant and so we're essentially gonna coat our mold with this just to give it enough um enough lubrication so that afterwards once your uh your plant clay is dry you can slide it off seamlessly um without it ripping or or sticking to to the mold uh which is always quite frustrating so here we go with that. And then the next step is really simple. Essentially, you're just grabbing your plant clay and flapping it <laughs> over your mold and creating sort of a, yeah, you're almost giving it like a little hat using different sections, different clumps to fill in the gaps. Did you try thicker and very, very uh, thin bowl? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing, the cool thing actually is uh, right now, you know, the surface is maybe a quarter of an inch thick. And, and once it dries, you get it. It's, pretty, it's paper thin like this cup here. So, so the, um, it's actually harder, especially to dry and preserve um, 
uh, a certain thickness than, than obtaining something quite thin. The, uh, the little tile, for instance, is um, the, one of the thickest samples that we were able to make. And it's maybe a quarter or three eighths of an inch thick. And, uh, and that took a long time to dry. <laughs> Have, have, have you tried uh, using a double-sided mold with a press to uh, just like, you know, the egg packaging, it's, it's done like that? Yeah, um, well, we, we definitely considered it. Uh, we haven't tried it out yet, but, you know, egg cartons and different, all the different types of paper materials that uh, we use day to day, like even, uh, you know, toilet paper rolls or things like that where all things that, that this could, this method uh, could, could, could address. Um, okay, so, so now we pretty much covered the bowl and the very, or maybe second last step is um, getting your hands on like a screen mesh like this, which you can find from any sort of old screen door that you have or something, if not it's like half a cent for a foot at Rona, um, but getting it used is definitely better. And the reason we use this is you can see here the surface is quite uh, irregular and clumpy. So in order to get a more a smoother surface, we're essentially just going to press very lightly with their hands with the mesh onto the surface. And this will get sort of uh, even it out um, give it maybe a bit of a, a gridded texture, which is kind of nice to look at. And also at the same time, removes the last little bit of water, the little, last little bit of excess water that um, we didn't get out earlier. So once you have this, sort of massage it in different places. It's important to make sure that all areas sort of have the same Thickness. Uh, sometimes you <laughs> realize once it's dry that some some parts, some walls are super thick, and then others are almost uh, almost see through. So we sort of this is all very tactile. And uh, and then you have this, and then if you're really really fussy about um, making things streamlined, uh, you can sort of cut an even edge with an exacto knife around the borders. Well, this is really thick right now, so it's difficult to do. Um, and then sort of get get a clean, clean edge at the bottom. I'm struggling to do right now. And my blade isn't long enough. So then you can work your way all around your bowl. And then the drying period is anywhere between, depending on the ambient air temperature in your home or in your fab lab or in your lab or wherever you're doing this, um, can be from anywhere from like several, you know, six hours or something um, to, to a day, a day and a half. Um, and so this, yeah, you see it's, it still has a sheen. The sheen will sort of wear off. Uh, once it's dried, but uh, but then a few a day or a few hours later, it's written on the recipe. I forget exactly how much uh, time it took for this, but essentially you get this one. Um, and if you try a different shape, this one is a little bit cleaner, smoother edged, uh, which somebody suggested as a usage. Was thinking um, starter pots for plants. Um, and we're also reflecting on, you know, uh, paper tubes and different things like that that could be applied for it as well. So, so the, the possibilities are, are quite broad and, uh, and yeah, it's kind of up to whoever's making it to, to find a, a use or, or in a way to, to, to interpret the material that they've created.
Here we go. Um, a question, uh, uh, does it have any binding properties? I mean, if you mix it with uh, some dust or something, it, it, um, it binds everything together? Uh, you mean the paper itself? No, no, I mean, the, this uh, clay that you make, uh, uh, if you mix it with, uh, let's say, marble dust, does it, mm. it, it gets the form, like, I, I mean, it binds together. If, if you do that with kombucha, you can get a, a pretty sturdy uh, material. That's, do you think that's a really interesting um, avenue. Like, I, I never thought of that, but um, I don't know if this is something, are you referring to sort of a more architectural um, Usage or yeah, kind of and sculpture. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, that would be that would be a really interesting route to take. If ever you try it out, let me know. <laughs> do, do you think that uh, this method could serve uh, with uh, another species of uh, inv invading plants? Yes. So, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, we're working with one plant that has its own properties it's you know compared to other plants it's quite brittle it's like it's really easy to um to work with and to blend other plants are are uh, their fibers are, are much stronger and so there's always adjustments i think to make from one species to the next but generally once it's the same in paper making you know people make uh paper from a variety of, of different um different fibers uh you know from like used denim to, to corn husks and so the whole the difference is in the um, is in the breaking the fibers apart to be able to create um, sort of your your homogeneous pulp, and but once once that pulp is created, the the different bindings and the drying processes are all similar. So it's really it's almost it's like a one size fits all for for most organic matter. You know, you could probably try it with leaves, uh, try it with other plants as well. Uh, the, the, you know, I know there are other invasive species that uh, are very different, like. Um, Japanese knotweed has uh, quite a, if I remember correctly, quite a sturdy stem. And so blending that obviously would require a different approach and, and breaking it down in different ways. Uh, but then, but then once, once you have your pulp, then it's just a matter of giving it a shape and, and of binding it together. Thank you. Hello, Thomas. Hi, I'm Nandita from Super Lab Kochi. Hi, sorry, uh, I'm just- Am I on Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Nandita from Super Fab Lab Kochi. Uh, I'm personally working on something very similar. Okay. So, you know, I'm really happy to see this presentation. Because uh, I'm working with uh, something called Salvinia mollusca, or uh, regionally known as African pile. Or, you know, maybe we can literally translate it to African water weed. Okay. Uh, so it's also an English invasive species, very much like milfoil, and causing a lot of uh, problems here. You know, blocking the whole waterway, in fact, the whole the, the state of uh, Kerala, uh, the water transport has been blocked. So I was just wanted to ask you a couple of uh, questions. Yes, African waterway. Um, so uh, just wanted to ask you a couple of questions regarding that. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think I have more than a couple. So first is uh, how, you know, <laughs> what is the fiber content that milfoil has? Is it like very high? Is it is it really what? Sorry, I missed the last bit. Fiber content in the milfoil. Fiber content. I, I'm, your sound, oh, I, I can't hear your, <laughs> your sound is quite muffled. The fiber, um, fiber content of milfoil, oh, is it oh, high? Um, that's a good question. We had a very brief um, analysis of milfoil in a lab right at the beginning of the research, um, and I, you know, we we didn't. I don't think we got to that point. What you do you mean, like in terms of um, uh, molecular composition, or is the fiber content like um, of, of the plant itself? You mean? No, it's okay. I just wanted to know, like, if you haven't done any research on it, that's fine. Just wanted to, you know, compare it with uh, uh, the African pile that we have here, and just to understand, you know, how much this, this can, I mean, our work is related. That's all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you want to talk more, if you want to talk more about um, 
your project or, or even email me. I can leave my or leave the project's uh, email in the chat and we can definitely talk about it uh, over yeah. email exchange. Yes, absolutely, yes. And you. Oh, one question, so I think I'll limit my question, but then one very important question I wanted to ask is, does it absorb contaminants like uh, lead and copper? Hmm. Uh, also, also, that's not knowledge that we have about the plant itself. Sorry? That I, I couldn't answer you on that side, on that front. Oh, okay, okay. You uh, mean, does the plant itself absorb lead and copper? Yeah, from the water where it is living. So that's one problem I have with African piles. So, you know, that's mm. why I just wanted to know. That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, what, what I know about the plants in terms of um, its interaction in, in, the, in the, the water that it's in um, is mostly in terms of eutrophication and um, its nutrient import to the water and also feeds off, um, it, it thrives in eutrophic waters as well. So, um, so with increasing urbanization and, and uh, agriculture in the, in the uh, surrounding lands, uh, which is the case in Lake Levering where, where we were working, um, it, it proliferates even more in that context. But I don't know about the mineral, um, the min presence of minerals in the water, how that affects it. There's also there's also very little literature on milfoil itself. Um, there there have been studies, uh, a few in the states, I believe in Colorado, um, and a few, a few in Canada, mostly in Quebec. And and I don't remember reading anything about its uh, the its um, interaction or, or um, the effect of minerals in the water, but. But okay, yeah. Nagel just answered my question. He just sent up sent something on chat. But oh, you know, Thank you. Maybe you can try 3D printing it or even you know laser cutting or something. I mean 3D printing you think this would be a great thing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah, I just threw a paper up. No foil is used actually for extracting heavy metals out of polluted waters. Oh, so it, it does actually take up the materials quite, quite significantly, at least according to this paper here. So, Did you see? Uh, do you know where this? Uh, the well, I put the put the link in the chat before you close it down. Copy the link. It's just yeah, straight up to somebody's work on milfoil. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> so I wouldn't eat it if I were you. <laughs> yeah. No. We <laughs> we were asked a few times if it was edible, and as far as we know, some fish and turtles eat it, but I wouldn't. <laughs> When making paper, you often, you'll use a, somebody was saying also, you put a press in it or you, you sort of shape it by running it between essentially or, or rolling it like you would with dough and stuff. Have you, have you tried any of that to kind of lay it out and make a thinner layer before you let it dry? Or is it, yeah. you have to let it go in quite a thick mass to let the water come out to make a film? Mm -hmm. We, we played a lot around with, um, with mold and decals, like in, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with paper making, um, but we we did follow essentially like more conventional paper making techniques where you know you fill the basin up with water and then we pour a pulp in it um, and then use a mold and decal to to create the sheets. Actually, most of these sheets um, were made that way, and and at some point we did experiment with letting it dry about halfway and then removing it and then sort of seeing if it would, if you could wrap it around something or give it another shape and if it would stick together, um, but it didn't really end. Um, yeah, and we, we moved on from there. But I wouldn't be surprised, you know, we, we, we thought a lot about um, even sort of the idea of uh, paper mache, like trying to, to do that and then binding it with something else. But as a, as a process, it was a bit, um, a bit more labor intensive and a little less clear cut. This was, uh, you know, this one was maybe the more streamlined of, of processes of, of methods. Um, but yeah, the paper one worked out as well the, with the mold and decal and, you know, other ones that we could have maybe pursued further, but would have been instead of like a two page recipe would have been like a four page one. So, so we went with what was, what was the clearest. Did you try any other Ah, uh, sorry, you go. No, no, that's okay. 
I was going to say, did you try anything other than vinegar? Have you tried uh, different acids? Uh, no, we haven't. Are we you have asking? Problem. Oh, sorry, finish your answer. Sorry, no, I was just going to respond. Um, I was, are you, are you referring for, um, the, the vinegar was actually for the smell predominantly at that stage. Um, and we were looking at, you know, bioplastic processes, uh, methods that vinegar was also added. And for some reason, when we, when we added vinegar, uh, for this purpose, it, the results I think were, were more brittle and didn't work out as well. Um, were you asking in terms of the bioplastic? Uh, no, in terms of breaking down the fibers, so you, what you want to do is, is take the milfoil and break it from being a plant to just being the fiber. You want to get rid of the right. plant part of it and just have the fiber. And so the, the more you attack the, the plant that before, as you mulched it there, as you blended it, you mechanically, you've broken it up. You've chemically broken it up by adding the vinegar to it. Uh, so you can process the plant a little more um, while it's still in its uh, cellular state. So you're right. essentially, you're beating it up, right? And to, to mulch it there properly. And if you, the longer you beat it, the more you'll get, and, and with more attack, you'll get more fiber out and less of the, of the sort of rest of the cells of the plant. So that's why I was wondering if you, if you try either a more acidic attack or a less acidic attack, you could, you could go either way from the vinegar. You were saying if you, if you add too much vinegar, you get a different effect. So the, the, okay. the stage of using the vinegar water attack there to get rid of the smell what are you getting rid of when you get rid of the smell you're getting rid of the decaying plant flesh that's in there so so you're you're attacking the material with your wash that you're doing at the beginning so i'm just wondering to what extent you know playing around with the ph of that state uh yeah well exactly and so you can you can take it all the way into a very high ph uh range or you can take it into a very low ph and depending on what you do to the material Right. Uh, I guess each plant reacts differently. So that's why I was asking was about that. No, thanks for bringing it up. Like our um, milfoil itself, you know, wouldn't actually need um, any vinegar or any acidic additive to break it down because it's so brittle anyways. Um, like if you guys, I have some, some dried milfoil, it's, you know, it's, it's tiny and just like will crumble and you can even make it dust as it be much in your hands. Um, so, so we wouldn't really need, you know, any acid to, to break it down in the first place. We, we'd only put it for, for the smell. Um, but yeah, except for instance, seeing um, different videos on YouTube about making paper with corn husks, for instance, um, I believe they were using, um, uh, geez. I forget now, but but they did use something in, in the boiling process as well because the corn husks were quite um, strong and, and sturdy. So, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Ania, I think you wanted to go. Yes, actually, William, you got a great idea because if you're if you're doing some fiber, you can actually create some threads with it. So you can actually you can knit. So you can have a shirt from algae. Okay, well. Um, do you have some problem with the uh, mold, with mm -hmm. the drying? Good question. Because it's, it's always beautiful and we just do it and then it won't. Yes, that's actually great that you bring it up because uh, last week in preparing for this workshop, I pulled out my box of prototypes and samples and, okay. and a, few of them, a few of them had some mold on them. I realized that um, those that did were those that I, um, some, some of them I, I either dipped sort of like, um, sort of like the tile here. Um, I dipped in more bioplastic potato starch um, or, or added a coating to them. And just to see like how solid I, I could make them at least or, or just playing around with that. And, and I think all of those that had mold were those that, that sort of were, were experimented with afterwards. Um, so, and that might've just been not letting it dry properly afterwards, but again, I know, you know, other people at the bio lab here that are working with, uh, bioplastics made from glycerin, um, the, the mold question always comes up and I believe that they just dab the moldy patch with, uh, with vinegar and, and so far they've had good results. 
So, so vinegar coming to the rescue once again. <laughs> Always vinegar. Always vinegar. <laughs> I've, I've applied uh, vinegar and peppermint essential oil to the surface of bioplastics before, and it seemed to keep away and kind of kill the kill the mold that was growing as a as a byproduct of the environment or the humidity level. It's very humid right. where I was creating bioplastic. Wow, it must smell good too. What? It must smell good too with the pepper. Oh, oh yeah. It was like, it was like, you know, we all get this. My body gets it, material gets it, the environment gets it. It's good. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, but but to, Kate, to Caitlin's question there, have you have you tried using a desiccator or, or heat to process it for drying it quicker or more evenly? No, um, we, we had quite limited means, uh, especially during the pandemic. So our, our experiments with ventilation and heat revolved around um, putting it over a wood stove when I was experimenting over the winter break at my cottage, which actually worked very well. Um, just leaving it, it was, it's a, a granite stove, or not granite, like a, yeah, um, sorry. It's like, a, it's like a, a stone wood stove and, uh, and letting the, the paper in the, in the mold dry over it with the press just created the, the most uniform paper that I, was, I wasn't able to uh, reproduce it afterwards. Um, but otherwise, it, it, it's stayed within the realm of playing around with, uh, vent, uh, with fans, and angling it over the, the heater. But, you know, it was, it, it's kind of it's special to work that way during a pandemic, trying to make do with, with whatever you can. So I'm sure in a more controlled environment, we would have had different results. And there was, you know, our research would have been quite different, but you do what you can. So a thermic mass with no ventilator, but heat. Yeah, and well, the paper, so the paper was still in the mold, um, if we go back, I can maybe share my presentation. Um, this, this is me peeling it off the mold here um, at home in the bottom left. And, um, and what I had was a few layers of, of cotton fabric underneath and a few over, and then, um, and then a flat piece of wood and then a weight over it. So it was being pressed down and you had the, the fabric uh, both over it and under it. And, um, and, and yeah, it just it peeled off smoothly. Um, it was uniform and, and worked wonderfully. But then, but then in Montreal, um, <laughs> I didn't have access to a wood stove, so. take it around to a local pizza parlor that's got an unused uh, or, or that or that i called a few places but they didn't <laughs> nobody wants to put that stuff in their oven <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly um are there any more questions or, or comments that people would have well if other people are going to ask other questions to what extent are you planning on quantifying this so, you know, we're, we're bombarding you with questions you don't have answers to at the moment. Hopefully you're planning on, on doing this in a more quantitative way so that you can say you know, how long and how hot. And, uh, so uh, where, where, where are you going next with this? Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question. We're sort of, we're a bit in an in-between stage right now, um, both in terms of funding and um, the new academic year coming up. Um, there are no, there are no uh, guarantees about where this project is, is going to go in the future. So I couldn't actually add, answer your question once more. <laughs> Sorry, but, um, but yeah, through essentially through getting these workshops done um, and having a presence uh, online and on social media is trying to get out and interact with people and try to like spread um, ideas about this. And also, like I was talking about at the beginning, using it as a platform to to think about how working with materials um, affects the way that we, we see these landscapes um, and, and our presence in them. Like I, I for one, um, even just in being out on the lake and like going to see what it looked like in like closer up and actually, and then coming back and having my own at home and, and working with it and manipulating it has really changed 
sort of how I perceive it. And it also has just naturally brought me to be, um, well, I conducted research, but also beyond that, just for, for my own interests, like wanting to understand more about um, how it interacts in, in, you know, North American ecosystems compared to Eurasia, you know, ecosystems where presumably where it's, it's native from, native to, and, um, and just has like opened a whole can of worms. So, so essentially it's tried, yeah, getting the ball rolling and of course continuing on reflections that people have also had uh, and continue to have today. So it's, it's not an original thought, but it's just a push in that direction. Great. Well, if that's if no one else wants has anything to say, um, thanks so much for coming around. And obviously, it would have been much better if we were all in person. But then maybe we couldn't have been all in person because I feel like people are scattered uh, throughout the world. So thanks so much for joining today. And uh, hope this has been really inspiring and um, encourage you to keep going in certain directions that are similar to to the ones that we've been working with. Thank you, Thomas. Very interesting. Good yeah, stuff. Thank you. Good luck with the rest of it. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, more a personal thing, but I'm in Montreal too. Do you, and you work at Concorde? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I come visit us. We're near the Metro Sauvé. We're neighbors. We are, we are. If you want, um, I can add, um, I, I, yeah, I don't mind adding my personal email in the chat um, if any of you want to take it down and if you want to reach out and discuss it some more, I'd be more than happy. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll type it out right now. You guys are making me nostalgic. Montreal is home for me. So I'm not there. It's not fair. Oh, where are you? I'm in Germany. <clears throat> oh, a little bit far. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Bring the pedal. <laughs> You're welcome. So, yeah, so anyone, yeah, anyone who wants to reach out, please do. And oh, yeah, the, the great thing with these workshops is like, I only have a certain amount of knowledge and know what I've worked with and what I've read. Um, but having this type of exchange is just enriching on all ends. So I look forward to hearing from some or <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to consider the possibilities of partnering with uh, like clean on a massive scale. So the research that you're doing could apply to industry. So if a business, for instance, that was interested in harvesting the toxic materials from beyond the nonprofit, beyond uh, from the from the environment, that could be I mean, you could start a business really easily if you get into 3D printing this material um, where you're creating some sort of structure from it, whatever that may be, that could benefit, you know, the extraction of not only the toxic metals, uh, I guess, if it, if it is getting those out of our water systems, but then also um, the material since it's invasive. Because, you know, I think about the the invasive species around Florida as a byproduct of farming industry that kind of come down through the Mississippi, through the United States and, um, you know, are gathering there. So it's, it's something that, you know, I've even thought about on that scale, but your, your, I mean, we're in different worlds, but I think at the same time, um, really similar opportunities could arise as far as um, the possibilities of business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're also we're reflecting at some point on the potential part, partly why we met with this community and members of this community in the first place um, was to get a sense of if it would be possible to there, there's like a almost a poetic spin on communities using like taking taking this material and drawing that is like that is causing them a certain level of harm and turning it into something positive for for themselves, whether whether it's turning it into um, you know their own commercial um, product or or making something that you know is is useful to them uh, in their daily lives. Um, and we kind of we were met with with a little bit of resistance because the general attitude is is largely we just want to get rid of it. We just want to go back to 
how it was before um, and sort of how do we just how do we just make it disappear essentially and what I was trying to say is like well you know especially in the case of Eurasian milfoil but it's also the case for most invasive species they're not invasive for no reason like the, the cost of getting rid of them entirely is is extreme and, and the effort and time um, that you have that you have to give essentially is, is almost disproportionate this is entirely disproportionate um, compared to what is actually the resources that are available and so and Eurasian milfoil like other invasive plants um, at small to medium scales are are not are not in as much harmful to or there's no literature research that shows that they are they are more detrimental to an ecosystem um, than I don't know than, than than any other plant so so what the problem is is when they're at a large scale so what if if we're able to interact with communities and create you know either programs or or any sort of incentive whether it's cultural or economic to go out and, and control it themselves through in, in a sustained fashion um, then that becomes that starts being interesting and if that way to do it is is through materials and, and giving a material form um, then to me that that is a more sort of a more durable a bit of a healthier relationship to to this problem than just trying to to wipe it out and, and send it away which is you know, which most most you know uh, researchers have agreed in that that is that's basically undoable. Even if even if you eradicate all but a small portion, um, if you le let that little portion go un unchecked for the next couple of years, it will just bloom uh, once more, and then you're back uh, at square one. So, yeah. William, did you have something to add? Oh, sorry. I uh, just click, click, click. Um, the uh, the trick is you're speaking as as an ecologist. Your your invasive species problem is is a definition one, and the biggest ecological disaster in the world is the North American plains, right? Where you've got a biodiversity of five, and right. that's it. And so if you're going to start harvesting, you just got to change your mindset. So you're in a controversial area there. Um, mm -hmm thinking about, you know, what are you doing with your lake as opposed to what's going on on the farm next to the lake. Uh, right. All of those plants on that farm are all introduced plants. They, none of them belong there. Um, and so what's the difference between harvesting your plant material out of the lake or harvesting your plant material from the farm next to the lake? So you've, right. you've got a balance, of course, between what people's perception is. But if you can make a product out of it, then yeah. But then you'll get the problem where you're not getting rid of it. There's nobody, you have no incentive to get rid of it at that point. So you're going to have to balance your, your attempt to get rid of it and what it's doing to the ecosystem with then turning it into a product that somebody's going to want to farm. And right. now, now you've really made a mess of it. That's, that's, that's a slippery slope. Exactly. That's like, yeah, that's exactly. Give it, spinning it more as um, maybe like more literacy building or, or awareness raising, even, even though that's sounds a little wishy-washy, but, um, you know, rather than trying to develop a product, I think we were, we were very careful from the very beginning that we didn't want to develop a product per se, or, or something that um, could, you know, hypothetically be industrialized because once, like you said, once you, you enter that, that current, then you're, then you're really going down dangerous waters. And well, it, it well, comes down to, is it, is it a slippery slope or are you already at the bottom of the hill? So yeah. if you, in Quebec, you give up. Milfoil is everywhere. You can't stop it anymore. People have this dream that they can stop it and eradicate it, like purple loose strife in British Columbia. You can't. It's, it's, it's out of control. It's gone. So it's like wheat or corn. And those are, they're plants that are everywhere. And you know, garden escape is garden escape. It's, it's out there. So do something with it. And your attitude is one of well let's let's do something useful with it and other people are like well let's burn it and um, well uh, make a product out of it make it useful but then you'll have the same problem we had here with people trying to get rid of nutria which is a, a small south american beaver that's making a wreck of, British, of european waters um they've started paying a bounty on nutrias now the hunters don't take them all because they reproduce right so it's a continuous there's a safe sustainable yield of nutrias 
And the yeah. same thing would happen for you. There'd be a safe, sustainable yield. You keep trying to get it all out of the lake and the guys are like, no, 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 no. Put it back, let it grow. We'll have it next year, right? Um, so yeah, interesting. Maybe yeah. what's better for all of us is if we just keep making these beautiful artifacts and then put them all in a museum next to the lake. <laughs> Then we have, now we have the, the uh, yes, the preserved bit of the thing yeah. we can do. <laughs> Once it's dead. This is the course. beauty. This is the beauty in this. And we can write about why we just need to accept everything as being well, okay. No, it's not about accepting it, but it's about dealing with it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of fun to hear your, your point of view. Of, you, are, you are stepping on some very, very, very thin ice, but then compare it to the farm next door um we were just talking about it today we've got a global warming problem the species here and in, in where i live are changing the trees are dying uh, within 10 years we are not going to be able to support traditional english oak in this part of europe it just can't make it not enough water and so we're going to be shifting the plants as always happens every time you get these shifts plants move around you're artificially moving those plants around though so but yeah, I'm going to use you. I'm going to steal your ideas, and I've got a I've got a eutrophied canal in front of my university. I'm going to start hauling that stuff in and see how much vinegar I need to make that stop smelling. Oh, <laughs> Try and make some paper out of the horrible stuff in my canal. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I already closed it once, but if this is really the end, um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, and. Great discussions. It's always it's always wonderful to exchange. Um, and please please write to me. Uh, I'll be happy to answer and uh, keep the discussion going. Thank bye, you. Everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Are you sticking around? Oh.